welcome viewers. I'm Janet Bridgers, Executive Director of Earth Alert, and we're here for the next in the series, Heroes of the Coast, interviews with those who have dedicated their lives to protecting the California coast for the rest of us. I'm very pleased to have as my guest today, Peter Douglas, Executive Director of the California Coastal Commission. Peter. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for coming. Peter, you've served for 20 years as the executive director of the California Coastal Commission. And previous, before that, you were deputy commissioner. Did your experience as deputy commissioner prepare you for the bumpy road you encountered as executive director? You mean chief deputy director? <laughs> Not commissioner. Uh, well, I can tell you that the, my work in the legislature really prepared me more than anything else because dealing with uh, the legislature on controversial issues and conflict was extremely useful for my work with the commission as its chief deputy director. Part of my job was to be the legislative representative. But it certainly prepared me to be the executive director because I learned about the important, the most important asset that the Coastal Commission has uh, is its staff. And it taught me the importance of recruitment, uh, getting good people to work for the uh, Commission, and uh, keeping them. It taught me about conflict, uh, which I already knew quite a bit about, but how to deal with that, uh, policy development, translating policy into uh, action implementation. Talk, taught me about civil service and the constraints of civil service, which still frustrates me no end, because we just can't do all the things that we need to do. We just don't have the flexibility. But nevertheless, it, uh, it was a good training for me to prepare me for the executive director position. There was a, a statement from a, an article about the commission that appeared in California Journal said much of the controversy surrounding the commission disappeared in 1981 when the legislature repealed a provision requiring developers to make low-cost housing a part of whatever projects they wanted to bring in the coastal zone. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about that statement? Now? I'm still very um, uh, actually angry about that because we worked very hard to implement the requirement to protect and provide affordable housing in the coastal zone and new developments. And it was working. And because it was working, the development community and local governments went to the legislature and said, we have to repeal this because coastal real estate is the most important real estate that we've got. And in, in the wake of Prop 13, they needed all the property taxes that they could get. And the Coastal Commission was requiring 25% of subdivisions to be affordable units. So it was repealed, and I think that was uh, a big mistake. Local governments did not take on the responsibility of affordable housing. We had the opportunity, and we lost the opportunity to provide literally thousands of affordable units uh, on the coast and maintain them. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we had so much opposition was because we had uh, affordable requirements that were in perpetuity for the life of the project. So there were resale controls on uh, units that were affordable and th that was key, I thought. And repealing it, I thought, was really a travesty. Uh, it still uh, really angers me to think about what a great opportunity California lost when that provision of the act was uh, repealed. Changed, certainly changed the, the character of the coast in terms of housing for normal it, people. It did, and the coastal plan of 1975 made clear that the ability to live near the coast was a form of, of access, and therefore affordable housing should be an integral part of the mandate of the Coastal Commission, and the Coastal Commission was making it work. Hmm. Duke Majin. Oh, yes. <laughs> Duke Majin and the California Coastal Commission. This was about the time you were first started as executive director, and he was the first governor to endeavor to curtail the effectiveness of the, of the commission. Tell us what happened and what the effect was. Well, he ran on a platform to abolish the Coastal Commission, 
He was an opponent of it when he was in the legislature. I worked with him uh, when I was working in the legislature. Um, he was consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he got elected, he couldn't abolish the commission because he didn't have the votes in the legislature. So he went about, uh, first of all, he appointed people to the commission who were um, opposed to what the law was about and who actively tried to sabotage it. Um, but fortunately, the appointing process of the commission where the governor only got one-third of the 12 member appoint appointments, he didn't control the commission, so the, his commissioners were often overruled by the others. Uh, but then what he did was he went after our budget. And the first thing that I got to do when I became the executive director in the summer of 1985 was to close our North Coast office in Eureka because the, the governor's people said, if you do that, we'll leave your budget alone in subsequent years. Well, they did it. We had to lay off about 25 people. It was a big mistake in retrospect. Uh, they left us alone for one year and then came back and directed uh, me to close the Santa Cruz office and the Santa Barbara office. And I refused to do that. I just said, no, it was a mistake to have closed the North Coast office. Now everybody who has business with the commission up there has to come to San Francisco. It's unfair to the public. It's unfair to the property owners. There's no basis for closing these offices. And all of the uh, information that you're putting out there that uh, suggests that we don't need them anymore, that's just baloney. It's just conscious, deliberate dissembling, misinformation, and refuse to do it. And fortunately, the Coastal Commission backed me up. Not the governor's people, of course, but the eight others said, we agree with him. Let's not close those offices. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't force us to close those offices. So he cut our budget. And, uh, but as a result of having some great heroes in the legislature, I remember one uh, at the end of the session, he had cut $500,000 out of our budget, which is a lot of money for a small agency. And we had a senator um, supporter who held up the Caltrans budget of $500 million, said to the governor's people, you will not get that money for Caltrans unless the Coastal Commission gets the $500,000 back. <clears throat> the legislative rep for the governor, the 11th hour and 59th minute, came down to the floor of the Senate and whispered in the ear of Senator Henry Mello, who was the one holding it up, saying, the governor wants you to know that the most despicable thing he's had to do since he's been governors, give the Coastal Commission money back, but he's going to do it. So we got the 500,000 back, Caltrans got their 500 million. Um, and then the development community went to the governor and said, look, it doesn't do us any good for you to cut the budget of the Coastal Commission because the permit requirements are still there. They need the staff to actually process them. You're hurting us by cutting their budget. So we kind of reached a, uh, an impasse after that, and it was, it was trying, troubling, but we survived. Mm -hmm. And we survived because the public support was still there and the support in the legislature. Now, Duke Majin was <coughs> also the person who changed the, the commission from a regional, or eliminated the regional? No, no, that, no was that was built into uh, the Coastal Plan, mm -hmm. 1975. It was built into the Coastal Act <coughs> that the regional commissions would be temporary that they would go out of existence by their own, uh, by the operation of law after a certain period of time. As the assumption was that local government would complete local coastal plans and that the regional commissions would no longer be necessary. So that was built into the law in 76. <clears throat> it was not something that Duke Mason did. But what happened was a lot of people thought that the state commission uh, was supposed to go out of existence too, and it didn't, and that's again misinformation, misrepresentation of the law never provided that. It always provided for a permanent state-level coastal commission. The regional commissions were temporary. They did their job and went out of existence in 1981, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, Willie Brown was the next major state political figure who tried in various ways to uh, affect the work of the commission. And now he was at the time the speaker of the assembly. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1991, David Malcolm and Mark Nathanson tried to orchestrate a coup against you. Tell us what happened. 
Well, you have to remember, I was appointed executive director on a seven to five vote in 1985. And David Malcolm was one of the five joining the um, four Duke Mason appointees against me. And since I've been the executive director, there have been at least a dozen attempts to get rid of me. A dozen, really? Before, to become the executive director, I had to be able to count to seven. Once I became the executive director, I only had to count to six, because as long as I had six votes, I knew that uh, I would maintain my position. And in 1981, uh, it was a, just one more in a series of attempts to try to get rid of me. But it was very personal. It was very painful, very nasty. Um, they tried uh, using, accusing me of criminal wrongdoing uh, to the point where I got an attorney, and, and it was so concocted so misrepresentative of truth that when it came to a vote um, in J July of 1991, whether or not to retain me as executive director, both Malcolm and, and Nathanson were not present because they had been proven to be so, such liars and so wrong uh, in what they were trying to do that to prevent them from possibly facing a uh, defamation liability lawsuit from me uh, and some other consequences. They stayed away and I was reappointed on a unanimous vote. And in fact, it was David Malcolm's alternate to the commission who made the motion to reappoint me as executive director. So, and um, Mark Nathanson, I maintain, was the worst commissioner we ever had. I've known them all. The best was clearly Mel Lane and the worst was Mark Nathanson who spent five years, as you know, in federal prison for racketeering on the commission. Uh, and David Malcolm has recently um, you know, pled guilty and found, and uh, had to pay his criminal penalty uh, for his wrongdoing on the port uh, of San Diego. So, you know, things come around. Um, there is uh, some justice in the world, but mm -hmm. that was an extremely nasty experience. Um, but I'm a survivor and uh, it didn't, um, it didn't phase my ability to do my work. It just was very difficult for my family, emotionally. Sure. Um, and it wasn't that hard for me because it comes with the territory. It comes with the territory. That's right. Um, they were appointees of Willie Brown. Were they acting under his instructions? At no, they World? weren't. I, I'm convinced of that. Willie Brown is one of the, he's a brilliant politician. And over the years, we crossed swords many times over issues. But he was always very upfront with me. Uh, I know he would have preferred to have seen me go because I couldn't be controlled by him. I couldn't be controlled by the governor. I wasn't controlled by the Senate president. I worked for the commission. And he didn't like that. Um, but at the same time, he also appointed two good people uh, who were supportive one of whom he fired on his way to the meeting in 91. Guy was ready to get on the airplane and uh, was told by his police chief that he was no longer on the commission because he was going to vote for me. Um, but they still didn't have the votes um, to get rid of me. Uh, Willie Brown was, uh, over the years, um, he was an enigma in many ways because he appointed some good people to the commission and some people who were very pro-development. Mm -hmm. Not that they wanted to do away with the Coastal Act like the Duke Mason appointees, but, but that they were voting for projects that clearly couldn't be justified under the law. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a difficult uh, go, but um, on the other hand, he helped us with the legislation in Sacramento, um, and so it was a mixed bag. But I had a lot of respect for him because he was just such a clever, sharp politician. He never wanted to cross <laughs> Willie Brown. <laughs> There's volumes to be written about him. That's true. And then in 1996, Pete Wilson, who was then govern governor, tried to, to oust you. And how did that came, come about and what happened? Well, it came about because uh, the Wilson uh, administration, through the, the Secretary for Resources, Doug Wheeler, wanted to uh, allow Southern California Edison to escape their responsibility to mitigate the massive adverse impacts on the marine environment from the nuclear power plant at San Onofre. And we had imposed those conditions back in the 70s, and we were pushing to actually make them work over the many years in between. Um, and they wanted out of those conditions. 
they found them too onerous, and we re I, we refused mm -hmm. to do that. The second thing was that uh, there was a, a project proposed for Bolsa Chica, the Bolsa Chica wetlands in Orange County, 700 homes in the wetlands. We the staff recommended against it, and Doug Wheeler was furious about that because uh, the developer had cut a deal with the county for these 700 homes and reducing the overall density, but from our perspective, not making any difference because those other densities weren't, they were pie in the sky dreams anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so we recommended against it and um, they were furious about that and asked me to resign. Um, and I didn't say I wouldn't resign. I just said I didn't have to time. I was too busy. Um, I don't have time to resign. And so they pushed it to a vote. Well, as you may know, uh, Chuck Pringle, very conservative uh, assembly member from Orange County, became the speaker of the assembly that year. <clears throat> First time a Republican had been a speaker of the assembly since the Coastal Act was passed. And he appointed four people to the Coastal Commission who were to the right of the Wilson people on the Coastal Commission. Um, and they, in a heartbeat, would have replaced me. but they didn't get along with the Wilson people. They thought the Wilson people were too liberal. And so they didn't, they were at odds. And plus they thought, gee, why get rid of him in the summer of 96 when we have a big election coming up in uh, November of 96? Let's wait until after the election. So a couple of them actually called me and said, uh, we don't like you, you know, we're gonna vote to get rid of you, but after the election. Uh, so don't worry about July, um, you know, we'll be, uh, we're not going to do this, this is stupid. And sure enough, uh, along comes the, the meeting and I wouldn't, I demanded a public hearing. Uh, I'm a public official, I wouldn't resign. So I said, if you're going to fire me, I want you to do it in public. I want you to explain why you're doing it because I have to find another job. Uh, and I, if it's for political reasons, I want the world to know that. And so I demanded a public hearing. They set a public hearing. It was in uh, Huntington Beach in July. Um, every newspaper in the state editorialized against my firing because what happened, I got a gift on July 4th. I was on the beach in uh, Point Reyes and somebody, a friend of mine from Sacramento actually, happened to be on the beach and said, did you see the uh, LA Times today? And I didn't. What happened was that Doug Wheeler, the administration was getting so much flack to trying to get rid of me that he held a off the record call with reporters and told them off the, off the record and told them why he wanted to get rid of me. So the reporter for the LA Times hangs up, calls him right back and says, okay, now on the record, why do you want to get rid of him? And he said the same thing. And that was in the paper on July 4th. They wanted to fire me because I wouldn't recommend approval of 700 homes in the Bolsa Chica wetlands. And I heard that and I said, yes, there is a God. Uh, and that was the best thing. You know, with opposition like that, man, you don't need friends. This was, this was the best thing that could have happened. Then every newspaper that was, had not editorialized, editorialized it. That's why they want to get rid of him, because he's carrying out the law. The commission should keep him. And so all these editorials were around the room at the hearing. It was, in a, it was a, a circus. I mean, it was... There were uh, demonstrations on Pacific Coast Highway. There were Hollywood celebrities who came down in support. I mean, I was very, I didn't orchestrate any of this, but they, they couldn't, they wanted to cancel the hearing because they didn't have the votes, which I found out about four o'clock in the morning. And, um, but they couldn't do that. So they had to go through with this uh, circus and it ended up being incredibly dramatic. People yelling at each other. And it was quite, quite, uh, the dramatic theater and in the end they tabled the motion to um, get uh, fire me and as a result of that um, as somebody said in Sacramento uh, firing me became a third rail issue um, third rail being that uh, highly charged electrical rail that runs uh, transit and you don't want to touch it um, <laughs> touch and, it. Okay. and so I thought okay well they did me a favor there too but that was a turning point. And in fact, that was in 1996 uh, when I decided that I didn't have a midlife crisis. I didn't 
really have to worry about what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, what my career was going to be. I love doing what I'm doing. This is a labor of love. Why should I change this? And that's when I decided what I was going to do when I ultimately grow up, which I haven't done yet. But I was 54 at the time, and so I tell young people all the time, don't rush into it, don't worry, you don't know what you're going to do. I didn't figure it out until 54, until I was 54. But now I know. Now you know. Kind of completing that, it seems like most governors of California have had some issues and problems with the, uh, the Coastal Commission, and Gray Davis was not an exception either. Now what happened uh, in, the, in the Davis administration? That's a long and sad story. Um, I think they just got carried away by the special interests that uh, they felt they needed to cater to, mm -hmm. pander to, um, to keep uh, campaign contributions coming in. And that was really unfortunate because, I mean, he appointed some good people to the commission and he um, gave us resources for the program that we hadn't been able to get in the previous years. And he was a supporter of sorts, but we just didn't have the deep down support in the administration that we needed. On the contrary, uh, we had more, uh, there was more harm done in some ways than the previous governors had been able to uh, inflict on the commission. But that's a technical, there's some, for me to explain that would take another couple hours. But it was a very, to me, disappointing experience uh, because we had looked to him as, as being a strong friend and it turned out he wasn't. Mm -hmm. And, but ironically, as his uh, administration ended, <laughs> was cut short, the, uh, the whole lawsuit with the uh, Marine Forest came about and... Uh, yes, it did. And uh, that, that actually, they had been trying, um, the attorney who was one of the founders of the Pacific Legal Foundation, a uh, right-wing ideological um, law practice that uh, basically takes on environmental regulation and, and promotes uh, corporate profit. Um, they, this attorney uh, became the attorney for the Marine Forest Society, found a judge in Sacramento who agreed with him that the Coastal Commission's appointment process violated the separation of powers and was declared unconstitutional in the commission. That went up on appeal and the Court of Appeal ruled, upheld that decision. Uh, the legislature then quickly stepped in and f established fixed terms for the commissioners so that they serve for four years. They can't be removed at will, which was what the appeals court said was the flaw in the law, that uh, commissioners could be yanked off the commission if they didn't vote the right way, and that gave the legislature too much control over this commission in violation of the separation of powers. Fixed terms came in and the Supreme Court, California Supreme Court, uh, upheld the constitutionality, reversed the um, appellate court and the trial court and, and upheld the constitutionality of the commission, which strengthened the commission in ways that uh, we had never been able to achieve before. So it's actually the law and the commission is now stronger than it was before that decision. You're working on getting permanent funding. What, what's the mechanism there? Well, there is legislation. Uh, Senator Simidian has uh, proposed uh, legislation to find a permanent source of funding for coastal and ocean protection. That means for marine reserves and marine life management, as well as the coast in San Francisco Bay. It's going to be a tough go because it means new revenues. It means new taxes. Uh, the proposal he had was to impose a $1 a night room tax on all hotels in the coastal, coastal counties. It's not a lot of money. That would have been enough to fund uh, the program, uh, both of the Coastal Commission and the, and the Department of Fish and Game. But the hospitality industry opposed it, um, and it didn't get a vote out of uh, committee. That issue is still alive, and we hope that we can find a way to establish permanent funding so that we don't have this budget battle every year mm -hmm. where we just are ability to carry out the law is really uh, hampered. We're handicapped by the virtue of our constant uh, roller coaster ride on the budget. Mm -hmm. As I think I mentioned before, we have one biologist for the entire state of California. So from my perspective, permanent, stable, adequate funding 
for coastal protection and ocean conservation is the single most important thing we can do. And it would be a great legacy for Governor Schwarzenegger to leave. And coming on to support something like that, uh, I think would be a great thing uh, for him to do and to leave. Or whoever the next governor is going to be, to leave that as a shining legacy to the environment and future generations. Certainly, you could uh, uh, handle some uh, support from the environmental community in suggesting that to legislatures. They, in fact, have. Um, a number of environmental groups led by the Sierra Club have been out there pushing, sponsoring uh, this legislation to try to make this happen. We need more support, um, but that is the single most important thing I think that people can do to ensure that permanent protection. We're into the last couple minutes of the program. Uh, but very briefly, tell us where the whole local coastal plans uh, stands. I think that uh, overall it's worked very well that local governments have completed these coastal plans and had them certified by the commission. And so there are partners carrying out the coastal plan. Have, have, are they all done now? Have no, they're not all, no, they're not all done, but 90% of them have been 90%. done. And then you've got Do you certain... Do think they ever all will be done? I don't think so because there are certain disincentives for some local governments to do it. They'd rather have the Coastal Commission do the heavy lifting on the permits. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I think that uh, the biggest problem that we have is that we've, we didn't build into the act the requirement to upgrade, update uh, these local coastal plans. Some of them are 20 years old and we can't make the local government revise them to bring them up to date to meet current uh, needs and circumstances. So it's really, that's the biggest challenge. How do we update? these outdated uh, local coastal plans. And that's one of our challenges for the future. Peter, it's been a delight to have you with us. Very informative. Thank you so much for making your time available to us. Thank you for having me. Viewers, thank you for sharing your time with us. If you'd like to know more about coastal issues, go to Google, type in California Coastal Commission and that will bring you to the California Coastal Commission website and you can find out how you can become involved in coastal issues too.